so uh, anyone else has uh, experience of working with uh, this kind of techniques in the audience hello hi jasim uh i took some notes let me pull that up uh hi so i i used to be in bangalore i used to run this meetup for a while it's nice to be back i hope i'm audible at least my connection was pretty bad and the latency sucked um some of the things i noticed is that heads request in practice is interesting uh for example one of the open source products that do something similar is cassandra when you cassandra is like a di distributed database that gives you scalability and uh, redundancy by storing multiple copies of data uh wait i think i'm going to turn off my video that might help i hope this is better uh so uh so so if you, if you actually like duplicate request for everything that can be prohibitively expensive even at like low scale for example the way cassandra stores data is to have like three copies of everything and whenever you get a request you ask all of them and when you have like you wait for like the first two to come back and you know that's how you achieve consensus and stuff like that on paper this is great but in practice that means for each request you have like three times read request in the cluster so i used to work for a bank we had about 60000 70000 read per second to cassandra it would like become three times and that is fairly expensive so in practice something like cassandra will only request request like make two requests and only issue a back background request if one of them fail or if it's like actually significantly lower than 99 percent i but yeah uh, it your mileage might vary is the usual case for like head re heads request uh i do have some stories of like uh, cron screwing up latency as well um one of the interesting things is that because of the way crons are scheduled so many of them will run on the hour so you'll have a lot of crons at like midnight a lot of crons at like 4 am 5 am and stuff like that so we noticed that our latency would always be bad just after like like the hour marks go on so at 1 pm it's bad at 2 pm it's bad and the way we solve that is to have give users no control on when their crons run uh and that in practice worked really well for us the way we did that was to write a kubernetes controller that took over time when the crons actually gets run except for like very few things that had to run on specific times this worked for users because they were like happy that things ran better but they had no idea when it's going to run uh something else about like micro partitioning and how someone mentioned like how clients would recover where to send stuff uh i have some context on this so now i work at apple i work in a traffic team so my entire job is to figure out where to send requests so this is close to heart uh though i can't talk about what apple do uh sadly so the way you do uh, load balancing the simplest approach is to throw dns you have like four backend servers so you put dns in front of it and you know just do like equal path or something and that really works well and if you are small that's probably what you do at a slightly larger thing what companies end up doing is like something like in data plane proxies like envoy or linkd or anything like that at my last job we ran uh, linkd at like pretty high scale for like two years this works really well if you are okay paying the cost of one extra hop in all of your network requests but this won't work at some particular scale for example google does not do any load balancing internally at all. they they don't have any load balancers of the traditional sense at all what they do is to have like fat clients that understand their backends so uh, the only public reference of this is something called like look aside load balancers and you will find that in like grpc docs so you have like a look aside process that kind of behaves like dns where all the servers uh report to that look aside process their capacity and how they are doing and clients pull that and the look aside load balancer will give you like n entries to look actually contact you kind of like dns so and at like really large scale that is what google's going to do you don't do anything like envoy and i can't say what apple do but it is kind of like google uh yeah those are some of the notes i did if you actually want to read about like how some of the micro partitioning works 
at like very large scale. Facebook has something called Katran, like K-A-T-R-A-N, and they wrote a blog about how that works. Uh, that is really useful about like how you can like shed load at like tiny, uh, yeah, like load balancing at like client end is what people at insane scales do. But if you're talking about something like under like 10 or 20 billion requests per day, like you probably can be fine with something that's not a central load balancer. Uh, yeah, that's it from me. You said you have some experience with uh, Finic as well. Do you want to talk about that as well? Oh, so Finic, uh, I used it indirectly. So Linkerd one was a Scala project that used Finical as, oh yeah, that's the link, uh, the one Mira posted, that's pretty useful. Uh, Finical is uh, basically like Twitter's internal RPC mechanism. Uh, Linkerd one was a Scala project that was built on Linkerd uh, on Finical, and that was used as like a, a service mesh in our case. Uh, Finical is like really rock solid and it's pretty damn great, but it works when you have few very large JVM machines. Uh, because it's it's fairly heavy, like the minimum CPU and RAM you need to run something like a single Finical instance with like reasonable load is in the order of like one or two gigabytes of RAM and at least half of a mid-sized core. So if you're running like a very microservices heavy architecture, you can't really use Finical unless you like bake Finical into your app. So Linkerd one in that sense, was extremely expensive to run. For a while, we were using something like 400 cores just for Finical, uh, and that is pretty expensive. Linkerd 2 does not do this because uh, it's not written with Finical at all. It's like an entirely new implementation in Rust. So just, so just to be kind of clear. I agree with that. So <clears throat> I think at Capillary way back in 2014, we did explore the Finical, and we kind of figured it would be like, uh, Hitting a nail with a kind of a you know a big hammer. It yeah. Seemed like so, a over engineering. Seemed like a not over engineering, rather a kind of piece of technology which may not be were at that point in time. So I kind of I kind of appreciate what you're saying about Finical. So no. however, that paper that they mentioned, the paper which kind of introduced Finical, the your server as a function. I think that came out in 2010-11. It's, it's it's a brilliant paper. I think again I strongly encourage everyone to kind of read it. It's a very it's a very nice uh, uh, nice. A nice uh, explanation of how you can represent, <coughs> create servers by simple use by using simple functional programming paradigms. So. Yeah. So, some of the stuff I did was crazy because I work for a company that run something like two thousand microservices. Uh, I don't know of anyone other than Uber and Netflix doing stuff like that. So we had to do odd things nobody did because of the other odd things we did. Uh, but for about four years, we ran Finical one, Finical with Linkerd one in production. It was pretty great. At some point, it became too expensive, so we switched to Envoy, which is like significantly faster and also so much cheaper to run because it's all C plus plus. And now that's running in production. Also, now in hindsight, all of that load looks trivially small compared to what we do at Apple. Like the iOS updates are like triple digit terabits per second. That's just madness. <laughs>